Welcome to the Veritas Forum, engaging university students and faculty in discussions about life's hardest questions and the relevance of Jesus Christ to all of life. I'm really pleased to be here this evening, um, looking forward to spending some quality time together and uh, just considering a lot of different factors that affect our lives, regardless of uh, our worldview. It's only about three or four weeks ago that um, I had the opportunity to be kind of like a superhero dad. I had a, a patient that canceled at 11.45. Uh, my son gets out of preschool around 12.30. My wife goes to pick him up. So since I had this cancellation, it was a perfect time to show up and kind of surprise everybody and say, hey, daddy's here. This is going to be kind of a fun surprise. Well, I got there. My wife saw me. She said, what's wrong? I said, nothing's wrong. But then we went to the classroom, and the teacher said to both of us, it was random that we were both there at the same time, could I speak with you? And so our hearts kind of sunk. Something on our face said that something wasn't good. Our son was there, so he was fine. And so we stepped to the side. And uh, so she said, uh, your son, Grant's his name. He's five. Grant's been having a, a, some trouble the last two or three days. In fact, um, earlier today on the playground, he used the F word. And we're like shocked, really shocked. How did this, how did this happen? And so my first, you know, I'm a cognitive behavioral psychologist, so I want evidence on things, right? So I said, well, did he use it correctly? <laughs> And apparently he did use it correctly, referencing it as, a, as an adjective for the cat that happened to be on the playground. So we had, we had to make a decision. And I had, I had to respond to the F-bomb. The F-bomb kind of fell in my world unexpectedly. And I had to respond to that. Now I could do one of two things. I could either take cover or I could get in and fight the battle. The game was on. I remember pulling into the driveway at home thinking, you know, I thought that I was doing a good job with my son and protecting him from things that could influence him and have negative outcomes, um, but I hadn't been doing nearly the job that I needed to be. So we sat down with Grant. We got in the game. We figured out which playground outside of our house maybe he had heard uh, this word and found out different ways and started working with him very deliberately. It was kind of funny. Um, we have this thing in our house where we say, you know, are you, are you a brown? And Grant will say, yes, I'm a brown. And I said, well, you know, browns don't just talk that way. Do you hear mommy? I mean, do you ever hear daddy talk that way? He said, no, I don't. I said, do you ever hear mommy say those words? He said, every once in a while, but it's getting lots better. <laughs> it's not true. And uh, we, uh, we had to fight back our laughs when he said that. He was, he was looking for some mercy and, and some empathy. So I tell you what, the F-bomb dropped into my world. I had to respond. Tonight, we're going to talk about two other types of F-bombs that fall into our lives, regardless of what our worldviews are. The first F-bomb is failure. Now, I know each one of you has been incredibly successful. That's why you're sitting where you are. That's why you're at Rutgers. This is why you do what you do. But I talk to lots of people who are really good at what they do. In fact, I also uh, have been the psychologist for the Boston Marathon for 10 or 12 years now. And I know what successful people are like and why they're driven and how they do different things. But this idea of the F-bomb, the failure bomb, falling into your world is something you either have to take cover when it falls in there or you have to get in and fight the battle. You, the game is on. A colleague of mine, Mark Finsky, um, he and I co-authored a book called The Winner's Brain, and the subtitle is Eight Strategies Great Minds Use to Achieve Success. And we're going to talk a little bit about that and what we learn from brain science, but this idea of failure is so important when you're thinking about success. I've said before many times that successful people deal well with winning and losing just as well. It's just fine for them to lose and to fail. 
people who are truly successful, true winners. It's a very interesting thing that we learn about our brains. Brains, if you know the term neuroplasticity, our brains can actually change shape. The landscape of our brains can change with effort. Nice uh, research was done at the University College of London, looked at taxi cab drivers. And the cab drivers um, had parts of their brain uh, that actually uh, were able to change as a result of doing so much of the training. By the way, I don't know if you know that cab drivers in London have to pass a test. They have to be responsible for 400 different routes in the city, and they have to be able to say, say those verbally. And if they mess one up, they don't get their badge. So they take this very seriously and train for a year or two on motorbikes around the city. Then they go in and take this test to become a cab driver. Very, very impressive, and it's impressive research. They also compared those cab drivers, by the way, to people that used GPS and also uh, bus drivers in the city and found the cab drivers were clearly and uniquely different. Let me tell you a little bit about failure. I know what failure is like. I'm not sitting and uh, standing here before you holding myself up as someone who is just like the success guy and that everything I do turns to gold. In fact, I would say that's not the case. I think uh, um, a good example of this is uh, I did a, an internship down in Louisiana many years ago when I was training to be a psychologist. And one thing they had there was they had a, a, a 5K run. It was under the sun, under the moon, uh, nighttime, glow-in-the-dark T-shirts. You get the idea. Well, so I decided that I would go out and try some of my sports psychology strategies and uh, just see what it would be like, see what it would be like to, uh, you know, go out, get some good exercise, all about physical fitness, and... Just try it out. Well, I did. I ran decently across the finish line. The lady was keeping score, or keeping times, rather, and I checked with her. I said, hi, just checking to see what my time was. And she looked my number up. She said, oh, she said, Mr. Brown, so far you're first in your age division. And I was like, interesting. Well, that'll probably change when other people come in. She said, but check back with me. So I checked back with her, and uh, she said to me, she said, oh, Mr. Brown, you're still first in your category. This is great. So now my thinking is changing. That neuroplasticity, uh, my, the shape of my brain wasn't changing, but certainly uh, things in my brain were shifting around how I thought about myself. And so I checked back with her one more time, and she said, oh, my, your, the times have gone on to uh, the official scorekeeper. So I went over to the official scorekeeper, and I don't know if you've run a 5K before, but like the official scorekeeper, there's this kind of this aura about these people. So I went over, and, and I leaned over the table. I said, hi, I just want to check my time. And the lady with her pencil looked up at me, and her glasses are down over her nose. And um, I said my name, and she said, let me look that up. And I said, uh, just kind of curious how that falls out. She said, well... Congratulations, Mr. Brown. You are first in your age division. And, Mr. Brown, you're the only one in your age division. <laughs> very, very true story. Um, but that's an idea. I would consider that a failure, in my opinion, at that time I did, because it's like, oh, here I was kind of setting myself up about how I thought about this situation. But I tell you what, I didn't hang around to get my first, second, and third place uh, prizes and giveaways. So I mentioned the winner's brain. The winner's brain, um, we wrote the book. It's a Harvard Medical School book that looks at brain science and success. I want to share with you some of the things that we discovered from that so you can be implementing that and being aware of that. We found that by looking at fMRI studies, looking at what healthy brains are doing, there was a trend of five different um, uh, patterns and five different factors or elements that people who are perhaps you took consistently to be here tonight, I don't know, that, that, that that risk that you take is something that successful people do. And the word optimal is in there too because you want to be able to make sure that the risk that you're taking is not too high or too low and people with, uh, who target success are good at calibrating that. The next uh, uh, factor that I want to share with you is called a goal laser. That goal laser is the ability to lock on to what it is that you want to do and you stick with it and you don't get distracted by other factors, those factors that are around you. For example, uh, we spoke with a man named Ramin Karamloo. Uh, I don't know, if, has anyone seen Phantom of the Opera in London? Ramin was actually the Phantom of the Opera in London. He actually went to, um, to see Phantom at age 12 on, a, on a, a field trip with his school. 
it was then that he decided that he wanted to be the Phantom one day. So he organized his career and developed his career in such a way that he became the Phantom. In fact, the youngest man to ever play Phantom. Um, and then was also cast as the, the first Phantom in Andrew Lloyd Webber's Love Never Dies, which is the sequel. But that's a great example of the goal laser. That ability to lock on to what's important and stay focused on that and not get distracted. The next thing uh, is the talent meter. Now, the talent meter is, is interesting because a successful person is able to evaluate their skills and abilities and know what they bring to the table. Uh, we'll inter introduce the idea of what's called the double whammy of incompetence here. The double whammy of incompetence comes as a result, um, it's also called the Kruger-Dunning effect, where you actually, uh, the research asks people to do a particular task and then evaluate how well they did the task. Well, they didn't do the task very well, but they evaluated that they did, thus the double whammy. Uh, a lot of people quickly decide, oh, this is like American Idol. You think you're really good at singing, uh, but you kind of look silly when you're doing the tryouts. So, uh, but the idea of this talent meter is so critically important. We interviewed B.B. King uh, for The Winner's Brain and spoke with him about what it's like to be eva uh, evaluating sort of this sales pitch, this thing to buy into. You know, as far as uh, Christianity and belief, that's fundamental that, that uh, Christ forgives you. you the know, teachers one both told him verbally about it. Another thing that you have to sometimes relearn, shame. Hey, many of us in this Go room back. have dealt with shame for some reason. It's a power learning emotion. something is a critical what piece it's meant when to you be. Don't expect it to make sense all the time. It just won't. It just won't. Think real quickly of a situation in your life that you just haven't been able to figure out. They come to mind pretty quickly. This idea of the expectations, I think there is this uh, a general sense that with Christianity, everything's great, everything's perfect and wonderful. That's just not the case. We have to expect faith to not make sense all the time. We're not protected, but we have to cling to a variety of things, and particularly in Scripture, uh, encouragement and promises that we have. So expecting that. We pray for surprises at our house. I'd encourage you to do that. If you're an adventurous soul, I'd encourage you, if you pray at all, or if you even don't pray, you might want to start praying. Pray for surprises and see what happens. We do that in our family, and we get surprises. And it's pretty unique and pretty interesting how that comes about. So we all have these ambitions. We have those, those factors that I talked about. Um, I think that it's important for you to remember the, that those, like the talent meter and success and abundant life, uh, all of those things do, um, uh, or they are rather, very accessible to you. Um, each one of those is accessible to you. The F-bomb, you can take cover, or you can decide you're going to get in the battle. Those are, those are choices that you have, and it's a unique situation. Talking about the talent meter, by the way, I'm going to tell you this quick story about it. this 95-year-old guy that wanted to be a caddy at the local golf course. Uh, and he, he went in and said, I want to be the caddy. And I kind of questioned this guy's talent meter, uh, assessing what he's able to do. But they said, well, are you sure? Like, you've got to be able to see the ball, and you've got to be able to track the ball. No offense, you're 95. And they said, well, you know, yeah. He said, I can see the ball. I see perfectly. He said, all right, you can, you know, the, the, the caddy boss said, go on out there. So the 95-year-old caddy is out there lugging the clubs around for another golfer. The golfer hits the ball, whoo, all the way down the fairway. And that 95-year-old caddy is just tracking it. And, the, and because it went into the woods. And he said, did, the golfer said to the caddy, he said, did you, see where, did you see where the ball went? He said, I sure did. He said, well, where? He said, I forgot. <laughs> so sometimes we don't assess our skills and abilities all the time uh, and do that very well. I've mentioned abundant life for you, and I've not quoted any scripture this evening. Uh, but I want to tell you where that abundant life scripture comes from. It comes from um, uh, a book in the New Testament where uh, Christ is talking about being a shepherd and, and, and tending to the sheep. Sheep are Christians. And tending to those. And, and uh, the scripture is in the book of John. 
and it's John 10, 10 and 11. It says, the, t the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. And that's like anything that comes to try to get the sheep. There's, there's no good intention in trying to get it and get away, get that sheep away. But he says, as the shepherd, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I think that's a beautiful image and it's something that for me is success that the part of and and the main part of all that I do has to do with wanting to live that abundant life and enjoying what I've been given as far as opportunities and success and so forth and again I don't hold myself up as the uh, success pro uh, I'm, I've learned a lot of hard lessons and that's part of the process uh, I wrote a uh, the first book I wrote was called The Competitive Edge. It was a book about integrity and protecting integrity and in competition. And the afterword of that was written by Kurt Schilling, who uh, you may may not know is a Red Sox pitcher, uh, very important in the 2004 World Series that we won in the Boston area. But I want to share uh, in closing just an excerpt from that because this is really why we're here this evening. Um, at the end of life's journey, there may be a few reminders of where we've been, a couple of World Series rings, a bloody sock, and used marathon bibs. But a life well lived goes much deeper and, me and reaches much further than those souvenirs. It's so true. What you're doing from day to day here at Rutgers, whether you're teaching, whether you're in class, whether you're being a friend, whether you're calling home, whether you're planning what you're going to do this summer, you're doing that because you want a life that's well lived. And I encourage and support that. It's been great being here with you this evening. Our time isn't over. We're going to uh, have some additional discussion. And I welcome um, uh, questions later at that part that we have to, uh, during that part that we had this evening. Anything that you'd like to ask. Uh, we have so much more to cover about the brain and success and the kind of the latest and greatest things your brain's capable of doing. Uh, but we'll transition right now and, and move on. Why don't we start by asking you some questions about, about what you've learned about the brain and, and how, um, uh, and what steps we can take to um, improve our brains, improve the way we think and, and act and ramp up some of these five factors. Um, are, are these five factors sort of associated with different uh, well, uh, are they sort of different modules or something? Well, they're definitely different factors. We call them win factors. Uh, these the factors that you need to have all of those bases covered uh, that I mentioned to be able to align yourself up with success consistently. I think one of the main things that we can be doing for our brains, and is a great question, something that, that we have control over on a regular basis, and that is that uh, we need to make sure that we're treating our brain like we should in a healthy way. I wrote an article for Psychology Today, a blog that it was, it was the title was three pounds you never want to lose. And that's your brain. Your brain weighs about three pounds. So the three things that you can be doing for your brain that's essential, one is exercise. Exercise, exercise, exercise. In fact, someone sent an article to me just this last week about uh, the, the summary was exercise can actually make you smarter. A lot of it actually is going to increase your, your IQ, but it probably makes you sharper and we, we know that it makes you sharper. You're getting, uh, you're, you're getting the oxygen in your blood. Oxygen is necessary for consolidation of memory and moving things along in your brain. Um, just some of those basic things. But exercise is something that's very, very, very good for your, for your brain. Uh, if you can do 30 minutes three times a week and then sneak in three more times of 30 minutes of something, uh, so we have this huge uh, 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 tea stop, subway stop, close to our house. And it, literally, it's, it takes a minute on the escalator to go from bottom to top. That's kind of a long ride if you've ever timed it. But there's stairs there, too. So we'll, we'll take the stairs, because the stairs, that's another way of incorporating that. Next thing you can do is what you eat. Watch what you, uh, what you are eating. You want your brain, and your brain loves things like omega-3s and 6s, um, things like that have nuts nuts that have uh, those um, basic bats in them, uh, certain types of, of fish, uh, cold freshwater fish, just watch the mercury levels and when you're doing that. 
Um, also, things that are, are like unfiltered fruit juices, they're very good for your brain too. Your brain loves the, the darker the fruit, the better. Uh, so if you have a choice, you know, you're dipping down into the, the salad bowl and uh, that's got a bunch of mixed fruit in it. If you see blueberries and blackberries, kind of scoop more of those onto your spoon because your brain likes those. Um, and the last thing, which is tough, and I saved it for last because you guys are going to probably laugh, is sleep. You know? I know most of you probably have very, you know, specific routine sleep patterns, right? Right. Uh, no, you don't probably. You're, you're up at crazy hours, you're napping during the day. It's a great idea for, in particularly, for memory consolidation. I know you've got finals week coming up here in about a week and a half or so. Next week starts. Um, if you want to improve your recall for information, everybody pay attention to this one. You want to review information that you have that you need to be able to recall, review that, and then go directly to sleep. Don't do anything else. Don't check your email one more time. Don't call your girlfriend or boyfriend. Don't do whatever. Review that information that you have studied. You can't just kind of gloss over it and that it's going to happen. You've studied it, but then you go on to sleep. And sleep for at least six hours uninterrupted. If you can do that, you'll likely increase the, uh, the recall and the ability to re remember information. But sleep is also helpful for memory consolidation, those sorts of factors that are important to just functioning, sharpness, focus, attention, those things. Again, those are the three areas that we often overlook. I guess one fourth thing I would add on, and that is um, making sure that you uh, allow yourself novel experiences. Being here tonight is a novel experience. You're hearing uh, different sorts of ideas and different things that, that people are talking about. And we're going to probably hear from more people in a, in a bit. But that novel experience is good music. Exposing yourself not just to hearing music, but you know, even if you're not good at it, try an instrument. Your brain kind of likes trying to figure that out. Your brain's capable of doing that. Even if you don't uh, end up playing in the, the local orchestra, wherever, you still have taken eight or ten lessons and you've done something with that part of your brain. So it's a good thing to be doing. Actually, it builds what's called uh, the proactive uh, brain. For instance, well, in, in a lot of religious traditions, there's emphasis on meditation and there's various um, patterns and, you know, uh, different uh, religious traditions suggest different things. And uh, I'm wondering if. Um, well, so, you know, finally I actually gave up something for Lent that was difficult. <laughs> and uh, and I, I sort of felt like that that that, that produced something yeah. in me. You know, that it, it strengthened uh, something, uh, kind of a, a mental uh, muscle that was weak. Yeah. Uh, do you, you know, do you find... Uh, yeah, so sp specific sorts of things to be doing. Um, one, there's an interesting piece of research that was done at Mass General Hospital by a, uh, a woman named Sarah Lazar, and they looked at, at yoga, and they found that yoga prevented the brain from getting thinner, and it actually has kind of like this anti-aging sort of uh, phenomenon that your brain doesn't age as much uh, if you're doing yoga on a regular. Any yoga people here? Yeah? There's a few hands going up. Yeah? So it... it the idea that, that yoga is very helpful. It's, it's a good thing that you could be doing for your brain. Uh, a lot of people use that time for prayer and meditation. Uh, there are jillion types of, of different yoga, but uh, the research is really pointing to that. Uh, I think the other thing to consider here, too, is that, that, that goal laser, that, that goal. What is it that you really are trying to accomplish? Because for me to sit here and say something that, that each one of you, you know, it's going to apply to, like if you all you know, stick your thumb up and then point it west, something will happen. We just don't fall into two categories like that. We're all unique. We're all very unique. And I think that you need to know what your goals are and then assess what, what your, your skills and abilities are that are preventing you from reaching that goal or what are the ones that you need to do more of to reach that goal. Um, there are many factors that can come into play and, and you need to know what pathway that is. Motivation is a big piece of that, right? Being able to be motivated to make that push towards success. Um, that's important. Yeah, I wanted to ask, um, 
I wanted to ask whether you thought it was possible for anyone to be a success, um, depending on you know how their genetics were or how their upbringing was or so on. Is is it really possible for anyone? That is a great question, and the, the, we do believe that people can be successful regardless of what they bring to the table. There's certain uh, again, I go back to this is why I think I buy in strongly to the abundant life piece because. Um, can everyone make a six-figure figure salary? Can everyone play professional baseball? No. But we can define success according to our own uh, hopes and desires and dreams and, and beliefs. And when we do that, we can actually have the opportunity to reach success on a regular basis. You know, uh, It's a great question. We talked to a variety of people uh, about this. Uh, a fellow that was uh, a New York City window washer and uh, we talked to him about focus and attention and how he's able to maintain his focus for a lengthy period of time. And his life really, in, really depends on that. Um, none of you probably have even entertained the idea of being a window washer in New York City. Um, but for him, that was incredible success. And it's a, a good example of that. I think that's the uniqueness, again, of that abundant life piece, that if you're living and having that abundant life, we talked about at uh, an in John 10, 10 and 11. I mean, you know, that's, it's accessible. It's available. Um, it's not just some sort of story. It's, it's, a, it's a, legitimate, a legitimate experience. Yeah, I guess I'm confident that my daughter isn't going to succeed um, academically in quite the way that my son has. Uh, but then I guess there's the challenge of finding her own talent meter and her own opportunity reader and so on and, and seeing what will work for her. Is that how you'd approach that? Yeah, absolutely, because we're all uniquely different in that way. And the, the talent meter in particular, what is it that you, that you bring to the table? Uh, what is it that you know that you don't bring to the table? Those things can, can be addressed and need to be addressed. What if you find somebody's fundamentally wrong about those things? They think they're going to be a professional baseball player and it's just not going to happen. Depends on if they're asking your opinion about that, doesn't it? Um, I'm, in a, I'm in a good position as a psychologist because people come to me and, and we talk about what it's like uh, and we try to assess those things. Uh, just this last week I spoke to someone who's, who's working on, uh, just was accepted into the FBI Academy, someone who uh, just ran uh, the marathon, uh, a variety of things that people bring to the table, but certainly there is this idea that maybe they don't have what it takes, and their talent meter is just wacky. They just don't get it. It's back to the American Idol uh, phenomenon, where you see people that want to do interpretive dance, and they think that they're going to win American Idol, and that's just not the case. Um, so everyone is unique. Everyone is different, and we have to assess that. Sometimes people don't want to hear that, and that's okay. That's okay if people don't want to buy into what we believe about them. It's helpful again for me when they ask for that opinion and I get to give that and, and have a really, again, within the context of that alliance, what I was mentioning before, that ability to be able to have uh, the power of us, uh, that's really critical in giving that feedback. Um, is it uh, time to take questions? Do we have a laptop with? Oh, okay, all right. Um, well, I guess then I'll ask about success and defining it. I mean, it's uh, y you can certainly define success for yourself in a way that um, that is just fundamentally flawed from a, from other points of view. So, so for from a Christian point of view, you know, if your goal is sort of ruthless success in the business world and and it's measured by the by the number of of competitors that you've destroyed, you know this is <laughs> this is this is wrong, you know, and uh, uh, you know it, you might uh, bring all these tools to bear uh, and uh, uh, and and achieve that, but um, uh, uh, setting the bar for what winning is uh, is um, you know you had said we let people sort of define it for themselves, but it can certainly be defined in ways that that you and I are going to think are you know deeply uh, uh, wrong headed you're, you're right, and I do think that there are um, 
individuals that have the the ability to be quite successful we actually kind of laughed about this when we were putting together the 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 construct of the book about how we don't want our the winner's brain being used for bad things you know <laughs> when they use it for good or evil they say good or evil exactly we wanted that to be something that um, was in, was something that socially made sense. We didn't want uh, the, the next latest and greatest serial killer, you know, trying to figure out how to have better focus and attention, you know, and waiting for, you know, that's not what we were wanting. Um, do people with bad motives, and as, as we talk a lot in our house with a five-year-old, bad guys, do bad guys um, have these exceptional abilities too? Do they align themselves? They certainly can. They certainly can. But again, they're not going to be experiencing the abundant life piece, but that's my definition. That's not their definition. I'm very willing to hear their definition, though. I'd love to, to, to talk about that. Again, that's where that power of us is so important in relationships with people who have values that you have and the, that you, um, you either share them or you don't share them. That power of us is so critical. Yeah. Yeah, I had one more question. I was curious about whether, um, so you talked about uh, the importance of cognitive behavioral psychology to how you approach life and also to Christianity. And I was wondering whether you saw a connection there, whether you do your um, behavioral therapies differently because you're a Christian or, or how did you pick that sort of thing to do? Very great question um, because I see all kinds of people in my practice and some of them come specifically because I'm a Christian and they want to know that I'm giving them something that is of, of sound, sort of scriptural, has a sound scriptural backbone to it. Um, I have a lot of people who aren't Christians that come in, and I have a great relationship with them as well. And that's fine, that's what I'm supposed to have with them, that's why they're there. In fact, I would say uh, I'm incredibly grateful for the diversity that I have with my, um, with my clients that I work with because they, they allow me to have my beliefs, they allow me to be here at Veritas Forum and they're fine with that. And I respect them for that and they respect me and again, it's the power of us that, that happens there. Certainly, uh, it's an ad extra added resource for Christians who come into therapy to be able to draw on uh, certain beliefs that we have based on scripture, things that are, are compelling and encouraging and, and uh, promises that are claimed in scripture that uh, kind of give more of an explanation about why life circumstance may be the way it is. And we certainly uh, use that and reflect on that and incorporate that. I did that th this morning with a, with a woman uh, who has a, a death fear. She's afraid of dying. It's kind of an obsessive compulsive sort of preoccupation. But we, we looked at scripture that talked about um, for Christians, what is death really? What is it supposed to be? Where does it go? Um, that wouldn't hold water at all if I had uh, one of my Jewish clients. Um, that w it wouldn't make sense. It wouldn't be within that range. So we would look at that, at that differently, but still be able to have that meaningful relationship. Um, I'm very, very much fired up about that, that um, I don't like it. I'll just be blunt. I don't like it when uh, Christians kind of are exclusive in relationships with other Christians, and that's it. Uh, I think that's part of what gives um, gives that that judgmental ping pong uh, some action gives it too much uh, we, it's an us and them sort of arrangement it's kind of like uh, uh, we get we get that judgmental uh, stereotypes kind of like was it on the Simpsons where the the Simpsons neighbor kids they sent them to church camp in the summertime to learn how to be judgmental uh, you know it's, we don't we don't need we don't need that and I think as Christians we have to work really hard not to be that way. That's not, that's not part of what Christianity, you won't find any scripture that tells you as a Christian you, you need to it's be between judgmental. between the mind and the brain and the soul. Now Mark here has edited a book called The Soul Hypothesis. We should plug his books too. Uh, I, I think, Mark, you should answer that. Mark, would you like to answer that? No, he's not. He's not. So uh, we defer to... Uh, so now I can be wrong. So here comes my, the failure. Here's the F-bomb. Did you see that? Mark just threw that over here um, with the pro here. Um, so the mind, the brain, and the soul. Uh, interesting stuff, huh? 
I mean, that's deep. That gets right at the at the core issue. So the brain, structurally, I think you can you can think about the brain itself as a as an organ, as that part of uh, your physical existence, and it encapsulates so many different, you know, jillions of of parts. It's a fascinating, fascinating organ. The mind. I think we talk about the mind. We don't talk about the mind as much as um, as we we consider like the brain a physical structure, but my take on it, Mark might disagree, but we'll let him here in just a second. The, the mind piece is, is uh, something that we do reference as far as um, I had in my mind. And I think the mind, there's a connotation there that there's kind of a, a, a thinking or a cognitive process about the mind. Um, I love the, um, you know, let's talk real quickly about Christianity, and sometimes, uh, again, uh, I'm going to get on a soapbox here just for a second. I'm, I'm not a big fan of uh, grouping even Christians into big groups of, of people like all Christians, or uh, one of my not-so-favorite political terms, all evangelicals. So, like, I've been a Christian uh, since I was eight years old. I've never referred to myself, I don't think, as an evangelical. It's a political term, I think. Um, but it's kind of loaded too. I've seen that used in context. The point is that, that sometimes um, there are certain groups of people who would be considered Christians, not all Christians, have a real trouble uh, with mental illness and that mental illness happens as a result of some sort of spiritual condition and that something's off. And I just don't buy into that. We don't have any research that suggests that. Um, we have, uh, I love the, one of the old hymns that talks about he the healing of the mind, um, that there are things that we can have as far as spiritual truths that can address mental, mental health issues. Uh, I see it happen all the time. But uh, it's, for me, a very sad thing to see that that person uh, would go through a mental, uh, mental illness or mental health crisis and some of their best support around them is basically saying, oh, well, that's, that's a spiritual condition. You're not right with God. Um, uh, you know, there are certain factors that perhaps uh, certain behaviors lead to that that maybe aren't godly behaviors. And then the soul. The soul, and this may be more of where Marx would, would chime in too, the, the, the idea of the soul. Where is the soul seated? I think that's been a question for uh, many, many years, uh, many decades, centuries. Um, the, and pine, the pineal gland, I think. It, exactly. So the idea of, of the soul, I think, is, uh, it's, well, it's not something, I'm not a, a, a cognitive uh, soul psychologist, um, the idea of the soul being um, that that central piece, and in fact, I read some research not too long ago about um, when someone dies, the, how what it's like for their soul to be um, leaving their body. And I think it's a very interesting, uh, interesting phenomenon. I think there was some was there an fMRI study? I don't know exactly about that, but how how the, kind of tracking what the brain was doing and and how the brain was changing during that death process. So uh, really, really interesting stuff. So. I'm not sure that I'm answering expertly, but Mark, why don't you add? Yeah, you know, I think it's a fascinating question too. Um, you know, we've learned a lot of new ways to study the brain. Um, tons of new information coming into that. Um, just because we get more and more information about the brain, I don't think we can infer from that that there is no such thing as a, a mind or a soul distinct from the brain. Um, so there's kind of a fallacy there. If you're learning more and more about something, you think everything is that. Uh, but certainly, I think any Christian would agree that um, a brain is a pretty important thing. <laughs> um, and uh, good to have one. You don't want to, I'll endorse those. You don't want to lose those uh, three pounds. Don't leave home without it. <laughs> uh, when we were working on this book, one fascinating fact, I didn't discover this, but, um, but um, one of the people involved in the project um, um, uh, called attention to a famous uh, um, early uh, uh, brain surgeon um, uh, Penfield, um, who was also believed in a soul. And uh, he was the guy who first mapped out the brain and what all, every part of the brain did and various sort of things. Uh, but he observed near the end of the book that um, you, know, you, could, um, you could stimulate the brain in different places and get uh, something like, like a sensation 
like now I smell rotten eggs. You could stimulate the brain and you'd get a muscle twitch, so, so you move your right leg or something like that. You could stimulate the brain so that you'd get a memory, you know, you remember your mother singing to you when you were little or something. Uh, but he calls out, um, uh, says that there's no place that you can stimulate the brain to get something like a belief or like a decision. Like now, I believe that the moon is made out of green cheese and you take the electrode away and I don't anymore. Or now I want to move my right foot. You can make me move my right foot, but you can't make me want to move my right foot. Penfield claimed. Um, and uh, I've asked around a little bit, and as far as I know, I mean, this was, you know, the 70s or the 60s even, I, d I don't know when exactly. Uh, but, but that seems to have held up. So, it, it, you know, there are some intriguing results that while, you know, ev basically everything we does depend on the brain, um, there may be a, a, a special role for something else to play as well. Uh, let me package a couple of questions together here. Um, there's questions about accurately gauging our abilities. We often tend to overestimate our abilities. What techniques can we use to more accurately engage them? Uh, another person is asking about the American Idol Syndrome. Um, uh, when you discover that you aren't skilled in the way you thought, uh, how do you recover from that? Um, and. Uh, uh, that, that packages together two or three of these. Okay. Well, <clears throat> one thing that, that is great news um, is that the brain can be made to be resilient. And I th so I think about failure and uh, repeated failure. Uh, the brain is something that can be taught and, and trained to be resilient. You may, I don't know, there's no way of, for me to know if you have a resilient or non-resilient brain, but uh, there was research done, I believe at the University of Michigan, where they told two different groups of people that they were going to have to look at some, at some disgusting images. And so they found that um, once they told the group that, oh, you're off the hook, you actually don't have to look at those things, then the group, they were able to determine one set of folks actually had uh, the ability to have a resilient brain, they bounced back like, oh, good, I'm glad. Well, I'm going to go do something else. Then the non-resilient folks were still bothered by the fact that they had been asked to look at the disgusting stuff. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? Because it kind of gives an idea about what you get focused on and that idea of, of bouncing back and being able to be resilient. So when you are asking about that, that that talent meter and how do you gauge that, we completely believe it's very basic stuff, but people frequently don't do the basics. Uh, one is to make sure that you're reading up about whatever it is that you're wanting to be good at. The brain likes it when you go back and review the fundamentals. Like Mark was saying, we know more and more and more about the brain, but there are some basic things, whether it's the brain or whether it's changing a tire or if it's something related to music that you're involved in as some sort of something. Go back and read the basic books about what it is that you really want to be good at and really review those fundamentals. The brain likes it when you do that. The next thing you can do is when you're trying to evaluate that, that skill and ability piece is to have someone in place that you know is good at what you're trying to accomplish because you need that feedback loop. In fact, we know that that uh, kids who have that feedback loop, there's research that, that, that talks about how that's helpful to them to have a, a solid person in their lives because one, it reduces stress. So when they're trying to learn something and get better and better at that, that one solid person that they can count on is critical for that. But making sure that you do have some touch points for evaluating and welcome that. Now, that's the hard part. Welcome that feedback. You want that feedback. If you don't have that feedback and you need it, you're missing out. If I submit something that I'm writing uh, to a journal article, for a journal article or um, more typically a book chapter or something that, that I'm doing, and I want feedback. I have edits right now on my laptop that I need to address. It's going to make me a better writer when I get feedback from people who are really good at what they're doing. It's only going to make me better. 
And so I go into that with the attitude and the belief that I'm going to get feedback. I'm going to fail in some areas. And that's okay. You have to, you have, to have a mindset that says that. Um, mindset's really critical around the whole idea of success and, and how you position yourself for success. More research that was done on Olympic athletes um, they evaluated uh, gold, silver, and bronze medalists to find out who was the happiest. Do you want to guess who the happiest was, gold, silver, and bronze? If you think it was gold, raise your hand. Silver, raise your hand. Bronze. Okay, well, gold is still gold. It was the gold people were the happiest, right? The next happiest was the, was the bronze. But the least happy was the silver. Now, sometimes when I'm out speaking, I have these uh, replica of uh, the, the replica Olympic medals and have people stand up and we interview them before I tell about the research. And they're invariably, I did this uh, at the Boston Marathon a couple of weeks ago with folks at the Runners Expo, and we talked about, gosh, how does it feel to have the gold medal? It feels great. And then you ask the bronze, how does it feel to have the bronze? It feels good. I almost didn't get this, but my country's proud. At least we got a medal. And you go to the silver medalist, what's it like to have the silver medal? Well, it's not the gold. I don't like this. It could have been me over there. And all of those thoughts, classic cognitive behavioral psychology, all those thoughts lead into that disappointment and, and, and sense of, of not accomplishing. For more information about the Veritas Forum, including additional recordings and a calendar of upcoming events, please visit our website at veritas.org.